Welcome to our broadcast today. I'm Ken Baer, one of the pastors at Celebrate Seniors, a ministry of faith dialogue right here in Celebration, Florida. Um, our, our ministry at the Windsor at Celebration is expressed in these three lines, worshiping together, praying together, and living together. We work cooperatively with all of the area churches in Celebration, Florida, including Celebration Community Church, Corpus Christi Catholic Church, Community Presbyterian Church, Illuminate Church, Celebration Anglican Fellowship, and Celebration Seventh-day Adventist. Our call to worship today is from Psalm 103, verses 6 through 12. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his way to Moses. He acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Today's music is provided by our own D. Bellavati, as well as his wife, Daniela. Oh, my soul, I worship you. 
Welcome back to our study today. I'm Ken Bear, one of the pastors at Celebrate Seniors, a ministry of faith dialogue here in Celebration, Florida. Today we're continuing our study in the book of Acts, also called the Acts of the Apostles. It's in a sermon series we call Unstoppable. It's called Unstoppable because we see that despite the hardships and despite the persecution, the church was and continues to be uh, unstoppable. Now, ha have you ever had the problem of, of too much growth? Uh, you know, before I was in ministry, full-time ministry, I was in the business world. A and too much growth was one of the problems that we hoped we would have, have in business. Too much growth. Oh my goodness, what are we going to do with all of these people? What are we going to do with all of the, the sales? And let me tell you a little story. Back in the mid-1980s, uh, VHS cassettes, uh, uh, the business was booming and there was a, a, a store called Blockbusters that started. It started back in the mid-1980s. It opened up in Dallas, Texas. 
And the store was unique because it had not only had hundreds of titles, many more than the average mom and pop store, uh, but it also used a barcode system, which made it very easy to check out and to be able to, to do inventory. Uh, well, there was a Michigan man named Wayne Heisinga that decided with a couple other investors to, to purchase blockbusters. And for $15 million, they, they purchased blockbusters and began to run it. Well, soon the, the business was booming. They were opening a new store every day. Can you imagine a brand new store somewhere in the United States every day? By 1994, just seven years after Heisinger had bought it with the other investors, there were 9,000 blockbuster stores employing 85,000 people. 65 million Americans were like me and probably you. We were carrying those blue Blockbuster cards that we could rent videos. Well, Heisinger sold Blockbusters that year to Viacom for $3 billion. And then he focused his attention on his other businesses, including the Miami Dolphins and AutoNation. Well, a few years later, a company called Netflix came in and soon began offering DVDs via mail and now over the internet. Uh, today, Netflix is worth over 19 billion and there's only one blockbuster store remaining in Bend, Oregon. Uh, so why tell, I, why tell this story? Well, for a couple of reasons. So one, it's a fun story. I love talking about, about amazing businessmen and what they did. But today we're going to read about the rapid growth uh, of the early church. Unlike blockbusters, we have no worries, however, of becoming obsolete. The gospel of Jesus Christ continues to be the good news, and there's no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. Now let's begin and read the first seven verses of chapter 6 of the book of Acts, or the Acts of the Apostles, and then we'll talk a little bit about it and, and unpack it as we go. So this is uh, Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So we see one of the problems in the early church began to face was the problem of, of multiplication. I remember having a problem myself with multiplication. If I remember right, I got the twos and the fives and the nines correct, but the rest of them, it, it took a while. Uh, this, the good multiplication problem that the early church had was with, with people. Uh, more, in, more case in point with disciples. The early church was multiplying the number of disciples. You know, sometimes we, we stumble uh, when we come across this word disciple because we think of disciple as another name for the apostles. While the 12 apostles were definitely disciples, they were just the first uh, of many. And our scripture today started with the words, in those days the number of disciples was multiplying. So let's define what is meant here by disciple. A disciple is simply a, a follower of a, of a wise teacher. All Christians are disciples of Jesus Christ. The Greek word for disciple in the New Testament is uh, methetus, methetus. And while it is sometimes translated as a student or learner, it's really meant much more. Uh, a disciple is a, a follower, someone who clings to the teachings of another, making those teachings his rule of life and, and conduct. Uh, 
The Pharisees prided themselves in being disciples of Moses. They told that to, to Jesus in John chapter 9. All of Jesus' followers were called disciples long before they were ever called Christians. They began their journey with Jesus when they heard the gospel and the Holy Spirit moved on their heart and they embraced the message of salvation. They believed in their hearts and confessed with their, their lips. They began to follow him the very best they could. Many of them chose choosing after Pentecost to stay right there in Jerusalem and have everything in common with all the others disciples of Jesus Christ under the leadership of the apostles called the Twelve. As we read through the Gospels and the accounts of these large crowds following Jesus, we see that often Jesus would turn to the crowds and speak directly about the high cost of, of following him. Jesus re was reminding them of what it would take to live a, a committed life. He said in, in John 14, he said, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Another time Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus wanted to let the people know that being a disciple would require a, a sacrifice. Not only a sacrifice, but also a commitment to the teachings of Jesus. Once, once after one of these hard teachings, the scripture says, from this time many of the disciples turned back and, and no longer followed him. Now, there's no distinction between being a Christian and a disciple of Jesus Christ meaning that all true Christians, all who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and who the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in them, are disciples. In our verse today, we see that Luke refers to these early believers as disciples. It started off by saying, in those days the number of disciples was multiplying. Along with the early disciples of Jesus, people like, and people like Timothy, the scripture refers to Tabitha, who's also called Dorcas, in, in verse 39 of chapter 9 of Acts, as a disciple. It said that she was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity. Also in the same chapter, we see the disciple named Adonias, who was told to go to the street called Straight and find Saul of Tarsus because Saul of Tarsus needed to have his sight restored. So while we're all to be called disciples, uh, as I said, all Christians are truly disciples, we have this word Christian. Well, Jesus used the term disciple, but never used the word Christian. Uh, the first occasion the word Christian is found in, in Acts chapter 11, where it says the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Most theologians agree that this term was likely applied to them. It wasn't something that they called themselves, but it was a, applied to them. And not only that, it was likely a derogatory term rather than a complimentary term. Many of the names we have today for the various types of, of Christians, uh, the groups that they belong to, the denominations, actually came from derogatory terms. Did you know that? For example, we have the, the Lutherans because they followed the German priest Luther. And the Papists, the people that followed the Church of Rome, basically said, well, we follow Jesus Christ, but they follow Luther. They were, they were Lutherans. The Methodist Church may have been started by Charles and John Wesley, but people in the Church of England thought these people were crazy, that their methods were crazy, and they called them Methodists. Uh, even, even the name Protestant, uh, for the whole idea of the people that came out of the Protestant Reformation, they were called Protestants because the Catholics were saying they were protesting. And just, <laughs> I guess what's good for the goose is good for the gander because the Protestants then started saying, well, it's not just the Catholic Church, it's the Roman Catholic Church because they followed the Bishop of, of Rome. There are other names for the early believers. Some of the ones that, that I like were the people of the way or, or simply the, the brothers. While being a disciple uh, is exactly what Christ had in mind, remember that because every believer is indwelled with the uh, Holy Spirit, he is the one that will keep you. You don't have to worry about not doing enough 
in order to be a disciple. God has called you, and if the Holy Spirit is indwelling you, He has the ability to, to keep you. However, I do like, um, there's a book by uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book called um, The Cost of Discipleship. And I like it because he talks about the, the idea of, of cheap grace. Preaching forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without any church discipline, communion without any confession. Cheap grace, according to Bonhoeffer, is grace without discipleship or trying to be a Christian without truly committing to Christ. The scripture says when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews. So, so let's dig into this, this next part in our scripture today. There are two, uh, two terms that we need to really define in order to understand this part of the scriptures. Uh, the first is the term Hebrew. Now, Hebrew is an often used term referring to the people that followed Abraham. All of the people of Israel, all of the people of Judah, they were, they were called Hebrews. In this instance, however, in chapter 6, it does refer to that, but it also refers to the language of Hebrew, which was the, the common language of these, this group of disciples. Um, Jerusalem was a, a melting pot, and the people living and traveling in that part of the world often understood many languages, uh, the most common being Aramaic, Greek, and of course Hebrew. Well, when the Jewish people returned from the Babylonian exile, there was an effort to have the people that resettled in the land of Israel again begin to speak Hebrew. And there was a good reason for this. All of the scriptures were written in Hebrew. Often they were not read, but they were memorized. And the people needed to understand Hebrew in order to memorize the, the scriptures. So many of these disciples of Jesus were Hebrews. They, they spoke Hebrew. These Hellenists, however, were Greek-speaking Jews, Greek-speaking Jews that had become Christians. Uh, for centuries, uh, both the Greek language as well as the Greek culture had become pervasive in this, this land that Alexander the Great had, had conquered. You know, Alexander the Great came in and, co and conquered all of Persia, he, as far east as India, as far west as all of, all of Egypt. Uh, for nearly two centuries, there had been a very uneasy relationship between the Hellenists. These were the Jewish people that believed in, in everything that the Jewish people in Israel believed in, but they, were, they spoke Greek, and they also embraced the Greek culture. So when the scriptures tell us that there was a dispute or a complaint between the Hebrews and the Hellenists, this is a carryover from the general animosity that existed for, for 200 years that had now spilled into the, the church. I, I find that fascinating because that's exactly what we, we see today. You see, today, even in the 21st century, uh, we, are a, we are a mixture in the church of, of various ethnic cultures. And, and one or two cultures sometimes are, are favored over the others in the church. Now, for most of us, over the last 40, 50 years, if you've been around, you've got to say that, that we've gotten better. The church has definitely gotten better over the last 40, 50 years with regard to our, to our diversity. And when I say diversity and becoming more diverse, I'm not just talking about ethnic groups, but also the, the relationship between men and women and allowing women to find a way to be able to, to serve in the church. We're much more accepting of the gifts and the talents that every individual believe, believer brings into the contemporary church. You know, all too often, people think of, of unity and the unity of the church as conformity or oneness, sameness. A conformity where people look and they dress and they act the same way, but unity in the churches is, is so much more. In fact, it really has nothing to do with looking or speaking the same way. Unity in the church is understanding that every true believer is in Christ. Uh, in, in the book of Colossians, for example, Paul says that in the church there's no longer Gentile or a Jew circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. 
uh, by saying that he didn't mean that those differences would cease to exist. No, they, they still existed, but it didn't matter. It was all about Christ. In another scripture, he said, it's no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male nor female. He's expressing exactly the same sentiment, the new reality that Christ is all. There's still going to be distinctions. Males, there's still two genders. There's still men and women. But Paul is saying that we're no longer be looking at the differences. We're going to be one in Christ. So let's return to the scriptures because the early church is going to have to deal with what's called sectarianism. Now, I know sectarianism is like this $20 word. What, is, what does sectarianism mean? Well, it's the right word to use because sectarianism is a form of, of prejudice. It's a form of discrimination or, or even hatred arising or attaching behaviors to a, to a specific group or a subdivision within a group. It's because of sectarianism that most of our denominations had their, their birth. For example, it's sectarianism that gave the rise of denominations like the African Methodist Episcopal or the AME Church or the Christian Methodist Episcopal or CME Church. These were, these were distinctions between black and white. Uh, sectarianism that, that forced the, the African slaves and the African free men to be able to start their own congregations. Denominations in themselves are, are not bad. I belong to denominations. I'm sure many of you have as well. Often people freely choose to assemble where their native language is being used. And that's a reason, for example, we have our, our Spanish services or Portuguese services or, or Korean churches, for example. However, Jesus called us to be one. And we should never allow our cultural differences, our languages or our prejudices or former dis discrimination uh, to infiltrate our, our churches. So let's see how this early church responded under the leadership of the apostles and the power of the Holy Spirit. A and they addressed this very conflict. Verse 2 says, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable for that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brothers, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. You know, the complaint by the Hellenists were that their widows were being overlooked or shorted on what was called the daily distribution. Uh, to this day, scholars are unsure exactly what that was referring to, uh, especially when the word table is used later. Because table uh, could be used in two different ways. It could be used as we would commonly use it as a place where food is distributed. But remember, Jesus went into the, into the, into the, to the temple and he overturned the tables. What was on the tables? It was for exchanging money. And remember, part of what the, the early church was doing is they were pooling all of their resources together. And there could have been tables in order to be able to distribute funds. In either case, the solution that was proposed by the Twelve, the Apostles, is a wonderful and necessary step. Uh, the church had been, had been growing. It says multiplying, and we, well, we don't have a number. You know, we had a number earlier in the, in the, the previous chapters, 3,000, 5,000, another 5,000. Um, we don't know how many people were in the church at this time. It could be, it could be tens of thousands. And these tens of thousands of, of disciples are being led by the twelve, uh, the twelve apostles. There's, there's no other leadership other than the twelve. You know, every organization, and actually the church is not an organization, it's an organism. Uh, it's comprised exclusively of living, born-again disciples of Jesus Christ. It's an organism, not an, like an, organi an organization, but just like an organization, it needs some structure. It needs a little bit of structure. Um, not too much structure because then the structure overpowers uh, the organism itself, the people. But it's, but it's important to have just enough structure so that people can be heard, so that people can serve and, and to be served. And it needed some, some structure, some organizations. So the apostles said that the people, the very people that were having the issue, 
the Hellenists and the Hebrews, the people should select from among themselves men. These, these men would be commissioned to assist the apostles. The apostles would delegate this responsible of the daily distribution to the, to the seven that they selected. And note the qualifications of these individuals. They were to be of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and wisdom. Uh, the reason for this delegation wasn't just to meet the need that was raised by the twelve. And again, remember, notice that often in the scriptures it's referring to the twelve. It doesn't even say the twelve apostles. We should just understand that to twelve are referring to these original twelve followers of Jesus Christ. But it says that the ministry of preaching and teaching the word was going to be paramount. And the apostles wanted to not be sidetracked in the taking care of business, as they called it, because they wanted to focus on preaching and, and teaching. You know, we should all understand the importance of hearing and preaching and, and teaching of the word. Uh, while it doesn't even mention that, uh, the, that the, the time that was spent and the kind of sermons that were laid out, uh, but you can imagine the, the work and the effort that was required to be able to teach tens of thousands of, of people. Later, the apostle Paul would, would identify what's called the sevenfold ministry. Um, in Ephesians 4.11, Paul says, It was he, that is Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, and some teachers. Notice that all five of these offices that the Apostle Paul talks about are all dedicated and all have the responsibility of the priority of the word and prayer. Paul goes on and tells us why God established this five-fold ministry. He says it's to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Today, the role of deacon continues to be very special, very deliberate. Choosing from those that are of a good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Let's continue with verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. If you read over these seven men, and you read it aloud, uh, you'll likely stumble over the names like I do. Uh, there's not an Isaac, Isaiah, a Jude, an Aaron, or Abraham in the bunch. All seven had Greek names implying that they were likely Hellenists. Nicholas, the last one named, was not even Jewish, but was a convert to Judaism and then, Judaism and then to Christianity. You know, I love reading this. These, uh, these apostles, these men, these men were selected by the people with the approval of the apostles. And evidently, both the Hebrews and the Greeks felt that the acknowledged problem of a problem with the distribution uh, to the Hellenistic Jewish widows would be best solved by these Greek named fellows. Also, the fact that Nicholas, a non-Jew, is selected as one of the initial seven is an indication what is soon coming and will be a rapid expansion, uh, extension, um, a rapid expansion of the church in the Gentile world. The first two of the seven are Stephen and Philip and we'll read much more about them in the next, next chapter, in fact, this chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. No further mention in the Bible uh, of the other four. However, as you can imagine, there are a number of towns that have embraced these four and said that they visited there, they slept there, they performed mighty works there, and there's temples or churches that are built in honor of them. You know, I prefer, I prefer to think that the other four were not named because they chose to serve rather than to be famous because that's that's the role of the disciple the disciple is a disciple that that serves the next verse actually speaks to the importance an important right in the church the verse says that these men were set before the apostles and when they had prayed they laid hands on them 
And the practice of, of laying hands on others was a gesture, signifying commissioning the power of the Holy Spirit and granting of authority. It's referenced a number of times in the New Testament, and to this day, nearly every local church, in every local church, both deacons and elders and sometimes other offices as well, when they're commissioned or ordained, the ministry typically will lay hands on these individuals. They'll pray for them, and they'll believe that the, the Holy Spirit is at work, giving them the strength, the power, and the ability to do the task that they've been appointed to. The Apostle Paul speaks of the laying on of hands when he talks to, to Timothy in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Paul says, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy and by the laying on of hands. And these seven and all the others that followed them understood that the pathway to greatness was through service. Everyone in the body of Christ is in ministry, whether you know it or not. Ministry in the body, to the body, and through the body. Ministry is, is simply just another word for service. And all of us need to be in service somewhere. As a pastor, I've often told people that are, that are brand new to the church, that are just coming and they want to get involved. And I said, let me tell you, there's two things that you need to do. If you do two, these two things, not only will you enjoy being here and want to come back, but you're going to grow. You're going to grow in your relationship, both horizontally with the other people in the church and vertically as well uh, with God and with others. And these two things were this. Number one, get into a group, whether it's a, a Sunday school class or, a, or a, um, a home fellowship group or a Bible study class of some kind. Get into a group. And number two, find a place to serve. You know, if it's, if it's a church that has a, a nursery, maybe just rocking babies or, or parking cars or helping parking cars or, or handing out the bulletins to people on Sunday morning as they're coming into a church, find a way to, to serve. Jesus said that if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you need to be the, the servant of all. So let's finish up today's passage with the, with the very last verse, verse 7. It says, Then the word of God spread. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. You know, from my perspective, if I was grading this, the apostles get an A, maybe an A+, plus, considering all of the things that, that could have gotten wrong. You know, Satan launched the attack first in the church through hypocrisy. We saw that in the last chapter. Then there was this competition or this contention between the Hellenists and the Hebrews. Um, but the apostles rose to the occasion and they delegated the responsibility so wisely to, to men of, of great faith that were full of the, the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, love it. I love it that the, the scriptures also tell us that it was the word of God that spread that the, it enabled the number of disciples to increase. It's always the word of God going forth first. And the number of disciples increase. And how, is, how, do people, how do people become disciples? It's through hearing. And hearing by the word of God is what the Bible says. Uh, finally, I love it. It says that a, a great many of the priests came to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, these, these priests are all Levites. Uh, they're born into a priestly family and they were trained for the various tasks for the temple there in Jerusalem. Uh, mostly uh, sacrificing, Sacrifi the sacrifices, daily sacrifices of sheep and goats and rams and cattle. Uh, the Bible tells us that there's no longer a sacrifice for sin that's left. Jesus paid the price once and for all. We come to Jesus to have our, our sins forgiven. We have a new life in Christ. The Bible says that we're born again into a living hope. And our purpose is to, to serve others, to bring forth fruit unto the Lord. God bless you. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you. Thank you for this passage today in the book of Acts. We thank you, Lord, how well you've given us example, how the, Lord, how the, the church is to respond when there's contention and when there's growth. We thank you, Lord, for the example, and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Thanks for joining us today.
uh, I'd like to invite you to go to our website at www.faithdialogue.org. Uh, on our website, you'll find all of our, our videos of all of our previous sermons. Um, there's also audio podcasts, over 120 of them now. Uh, thank you for your friendship, your prayers, and your financial support. Go with this benediction from, from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. And let this be a blessing to you. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. God bless. Have a great day.